that we are recording this meet this um this session we're recording it because we have 77 probably on our way up to about 100 people who will be joining us today uh, but there'll be another 100 or 200 that want to see this later they're either stuck with work or family um, uh, issues or interests or something else going on in their lives and they just can't join today so we will make it available on our virtual library if you go to the cmc.edu slash alumni or slash parent website click on our virtual library you can see professor shields program and of course all the other programs we've had over the last couple of months uh, a few things about uh, Zoom and about our program today. First, if you look at the bottom, you can click on both the chat feature and the participants feature. That should pop up to the right, a couple of boxes. The chat feature, you'll see people putting their name and their class years and their locations. Um, when we get to the question and answer session, probably in about a half hour, I will also read questions from the chat to Professor Shields um, on your behalf. So you can feel free to put questions in there. Uh, we even have London represented, hi Tim. Um, and then in the participant section, there's something called raise hand. If you want to ask your question directly, if you want to talk, uh, right, speak right to uh, Professor Shields, just click raise hand and we'll get to you uh, in the appropriate order uh, during the Q&A section uh, as well. And in the top right, there's both speaker view and grid view. You can choose whether you want to see only the speaker. So if you're on speaker view, you will see just me right now uh, with a few, uh, a few smaller um, uh, boxes up top. Uh, and if you want to see uh, the grid view, seeing 20, 30, or 40 people, put it on grid view and you, you see probably five or six people across and, and five or six different rows of people uh, going up and down. So it's up to uh, you and your preference. Um, as many of you know, we sent our students home in mid-March. It was a very difficult decision. Uh, and I'm proud to report that we are very actively working to bring all of our students, faculty, and staff back to campus in August. It is our hope. It is our goal. Uh, that we will have an in-person experience for all of our students starting in August with a, uh, a, a, a semester that will be slightly um, altered to accommodate for um, different schedules and for um, appropriate travel times come Thanksgiving and the end of the year. Uh, it is almost June 30. Uh, we are wrapping up our end of the academic year and the fiscal year. If you have yet to make your annual contribution to the college, whether it's $20 and 20 cents in honor of our class of 2020 or whatever you can, whatever you can do, will help us as we, um, as we gear up for a very rigorous response to COVID-19 and bringing back all of our students, regardless of financial need, uh, to the campus. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor John Shields, an Associate Professor of Government since 2008 at CMC. He teaches two very popular courses. One is the University Blacklist, uh, which is co-taught between himself uh, and a professor at Pitzer, very popular, and American Culture Wars. Uh, Professor Shields has recently written two very popular books, um, uh, Trump's Democrats most recently, which we'll be talking about today, um, and, uh, and um, his other book was Passing on the Right to Conservative Professors in a Progressive University, which is a very interesting topic that hopefully we can touch on at some point uh, in the hour. So it's my pleasure to turn the uh, microphone over to Professor Shields. Professor Shields, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks, Evan. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for, to all of you uh, for uh, joining me today. Thanks to my former students who are here. Thanks to the alums and parents. Um, and thanks to my mom, who's actually watching Chew out there somewhere. So hi, mom. Thanks for, thanks for jumping on today. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I've shared my screen yet. Whoops, let me uh, go back. Um, let's see. Uh, let me try to do that one second. I'm gonna do a slideshow that's part of my, um, uh, uh, that's part of my lecture today. So let's see. Okay, um, great. So everyone can see the, um, the PowerPoint. Um, okay, great. So I'm gonna talk about um, a new book that'll be out in September. Uh, it's called Trump's Democrats. And the origins of this book really began on election night in 2016. And of course, there are a lot of books that were born on that night, right? Like lots of Americans. I was glued to my laptop watching the precinct data roll in. And um, my sense uh, of astonishment um, really deepened in the days and weeks that followed the election uh, because not Shortly after Trump won, I learned that there were more than 200 counties that had voted for Obama, 
uh, both times, right, in both 2008 and 2012, flipped and voted for Donald Trump. You can see a map here. Uh, it'll give you some sense of the um, of where these places are. And um, so these are these are flip counties. These are places that voted for Obama and then flipped to Trump. And um, and when I dug deeper, I learned that many of these places had not just voted for Obama. They had also been really loyal to the Democratic Party for a very long time, right? So many had not voted for a Republican candidate since uh, since Reagan in the 80s. There was another big cluster that had not voted for a Republican presidential presidential candidate since Nixon in 72. And there were some places with even longer unbroken records of supporting the Democratic Party. Some stretched all the way back to the New Deal. And one county, there was one county in Kentucky called Elliott County uh, that had never in its history voted for a Republican uh, since the county was formed in the 19th century, right? Um, um, and yet Trump won over 70% of the vote in Elliott County, right? This is a place where the where the ratio of registered Democrats to Republicans is the same as San Francisco's, right? And yet it voted for, um, it swung for Trump. Now, of course, you know, sometimes blue counties flip, right? This isn't unheard of, this happens. Uh, we're accustomed to talking about the Nixon Democrats in 1972 and the Reagan Democrats in 1984. But here's the thing. The Trump Democrats are a lot more interesting and surprising. The elections in 1972 and 1984 were landslides, right? So it's not surprising that in a landslide election, you're going to get some flipped blue counties, right? Um, but that was the case in 72 in, in 84, right? Really just um, um, uh, Nixon cream McGovern in 1972. It was one of the most lopsided elections in American history. Um, not, this is a map of 1984. Looks very similar, right, to the map in 1972. Um, and here Reagan uh, creamed Mondale. Um, but, but the election of 2016 wasn't at all like the elections of 1972 or 1984. Right? Not only was it not a landslide for Donald Trump, but he actually lost the popular vote, right? And yet, and yet, right, he still managed, he still managed to win some of the most loyal blue communities in the country. Okay, so that, um, that was astonishing to me. Uh, I, at that point, I was really uh, itching to, to leave Claremont, to get out of Claremont. And I wanted to go live in these places and interview folks and get a sense of what was of what happened, right? I wanted to know why so many reliably strong blue strongholds would suddenly flip and vote for Donald Trump, right? Um, why are some democratic communities so different from the ones that I'm more familiar with, right? Like here in Claremont, right? Um, and how should we understand this divide that's opened up inside of blue America, right? How do, how do we make sense of it? And so I hatched a plan to um, explore these questions with uh, Stephanie Moravchek, who is um, my co-author of this book. Um, it was also an easy partnership to, to, to strike since I had an in, right? Um, in addition to being an excellent scholar uh, Stephanie is also my wife, right? And um, and actually, when I tell my friends, you know, that my wife and I wrote a book to, wrote a book together, uh, they're often just astonished, right? They tell us things like, "Gee, you know, we can't even go grocery shopping together." Like, you know, how do you write a whole book together, right? Um, but we had a we had a great time, and and that first um, and and so we we uh, packed up the whole family. Uh, including our three kids. Here they are. This is just a few. I couldn't, I couldn't resist. This is our three kids. Um, uh, and this is just a few weeks before we headed off to uh, uh, spend our first summer doing field work. They're locked and loaded and ready to go. And we, uh, we selected three towns to study um, in different regions of the country. Um, um, one is uh, Ottumwa, Iowa. I've, we've, I've circled it here on the map. 
Uh, another is the uh, aforementioned Elliott County, Kentucky. And the other is um, uh, Johnston, uh, Rhode Island. And each town is uh, distinctive. You know, uh, Atumwa is an industrial Rust Belt town, um, really sort of a small city. Um, Elliott is very rural, very small. Uh, it's coal country, uh, has a history of tobacco farming. And um, in Johnston, Rhode Island is, is integrated into metropolitan Providence. You know, it's a suburb of Providence with a large Italian American population um, and um, really interesting place. But they all have one thing in common, right? They've all been dominated by the Democratic Party. They're all deeply blue towns, right? They're all one party communities where the Democrats, you know, all the local politicians are Democrats and the vast majority of, of its local citizens are registered as Democrats. And we lived in uh, for six weeks in each of these places. And this social immersion really allowed us to observe the differences between these democratic communities and the ones that, you know, we're more familiar with. Um, and, and, and that immersion really allowed us to really get a sense of the, the different political and moral and, and social norms uh, between these different types of democratic communities. So we conducted about 95 formal interviews in each place. We engaged in lots of more casual conversations, but we also just did a lot of observing, right? I mean, we just observed citizens in their everyday life, in their churches, in their bars, in their coffee shops. Um, in their town council meetings. We soaked up the local culture. Um, and we have a whole argument in the book actually about why this method is really important in this era of big data. And I'm happy to talk a little bit about that later if, if, if you like. So what did we find, right? Uh, what did we find? Um, I don't have time today. I don't want to take up all your time because I want to get to your questions. So I can't talk about all the findings in the book. I'm just going to talk about um, some of them. Um, and, and one thing that really struck us about these places is that uh, Trump, is, um, Trump is familiar in many ways in these places. Um, um, and one reason that's true is all of these places have a long history um, of being governed by political machines uh, and by machine bosses. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about them. But, um, political machines once dominated um, uh, the Democratic Party in lots of cities throughout the country. Um, they've since been pushed out of the big cities by reformers, right? So uh, they no longer rule places like Chicago and Boston, but they, a, a sort of tradition of machine politics persisted much longer in smaller communities where machines had uh, faced fewer foes. And, and so in some of these communities, some of the most beloved and longest serving Democratic leaders are quite Trumpian, right? They're quite Trumpian, they're grandiose, they're combative, they're thin-skinned. Um, like machine bosses of old, they're totally indifferent to ideology, right? They, instead, they promise to take care of their people by cutting deals and corners if needed. Uh, there's a long, there's a lot of, there's a history of corruption, of political corruption in all of these communities. Um, Political nepotism is still the norm. So political elites turn to family to fill important political roles in these communities. And there's a long tradition of that. Um, and, and so Trump is not merely another, you know, Republican business person turned politician, right? Like Mitt Romney uh, or Meg, Rit Meg Whitman or somebody like that, right? Trump's persona is not one that resembles right, the bosses of corporate America, but rather the local political bosses that once, once ruled these, these political machines. Um, and one reason that's true is because, is because these, these machine bosses and Trump have been shaped by an honor culture. And I'd like to give you a little richer sense of what an honor culture is today and why it still matters to, to our politics. Now, whenever I talk about honor culture and Donald Trump, I like to begin by pointing to the most famous, the most famous Trump Democrat, who is, of course, Kanye West. And if you don't know Kanye West, um, he a few years ago, uh, 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 you know, he declared his kinship 
to Donald Trump via Twitter. And he tweeted, and I'm quoting, quoting Kanye here. He said, we're both dragon energy. He is my brother, right? This, of course, he's married to Kim Kardashian, if you don't know this. That sent her into a panic, as you might imagine. And, uh, you know, a baffled media tried to make sense of this. You know, why would, why would Kanye West, this African-American, feel such a deep kinship with Donald Trump, right? Why would he declare that, that in fact, that they're brothers? Well, one thing that struck Stephanie, Stephanie and I is that um, when we visited uh, these three communities, um, the people there like Trump's dragon energy too, right? And that's because these places and Kanye West have been deeply shaped by an honor culture. So I'm gonna tell you what it is in sort of the abstract and, the, and then I'm gonna sort of talk about um, some of our, uh, uh, some evidence for it. Well, when social scientists peer outside of their own uh, highly educated um, metropolitan centers and college towns, well, they keep finding honor cultures. They're, they're really everywhere. Um, uh, they're found in places uh, that are as varied as, 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 as um, uh, black urban ghettos. They're found in rural Appalachia. They're found in many Im uh, uh, immigrant communities. And they're found in many small towns with lots of white working class Americans. And if you live in an honor culture, you're expected uh, to defend your reputation for toughness, your social reputation for toughness, right? That's what's key. Um, and that means uh, you can never let anything slide off your back. You always have to punch back uh, if you're challenged in some way. And if you don't, if you don't do that, it's seen as a sign of weakness, right? It's seen as a sign of weakness, which tarnishes, again, your reputation for tough toughness. And this is certainly Trump's philosophy of, of leadership. Um, he once told a personal friend, and I'm quoting Trump now, he said, real power is fear. It's all about strength. Never show weakness. You've always got to be strong. Don't be bullied. There is no choice, right? There's no alternative leadership styles that'll work, right? If you're Donald Trump, right? You're either tough or you're weak, right? And that's more or less how he divides up to the world, right? There, there, there's strong people and there's weak people. And, um, and that's more or less how he, how he, how he sees it. Um, and this explains some seemingly odd behavior that Trump engages in at times, right? Um, like his refusal to wear masks, right, uh, recently, um, um, right? It's, it's very important to Trump never to show weakness, even if it's gonna kill him, right? He doesn't wanna do it. Um, it's important that he's always a tough guy. Okay, I think what's important here is that, um, you know, many critics of Trump see his relentless counterpunching uh, as evidence of his narcissism and thin skin. And I think he's, he's a narcissist. But to characterize Trump in this way misses the way. It misses the way in which Trump's behavior is totally normal. It's totally normal outside of Claremont and San Francisco and Brookline and Washington DC and lots of other communities that I live in, lots of my colleagues live in, and many of you live in. Right? So I'll give you a sense of what this looks like on the ground. I sat down with a guy named Jimmy in a meatpacking plant, uh, actually at the Union Hall, at his Union. I've got a picture of it, actually. This is the Union um, in Ottumwa, Iowa. And I sat down with Jimmy, and Jimmy's, um, he's worked in the plant for about 16 years. He used to work on the line carving up hogs, which is very hard work, and it got to be very hard on his body. So now he does custodial uh, work. And um, I asked him what he liked about Trump, you know, and this is what Jimmy told me. He said, his strength, you know, he's a really strong person. I could see that. And he's not going to be bullied by anyone. We've lacked this. This country has just been weak. And when he spoke, it brought power back. And people feel threatened by that power. I've never seen a guy that has so much energy. Thank God he didn't see, he didn't say dragon energy, right? Because no one would believe me, right? If he actually said dragon energy. Um, okay. Um, or, consider, or consider another case. Consider the case of Vicky. Uh, I interviewed Vicky also in a, of Atamwa. 
Uh, she spent her life as a trucker and later worked in a corn processing plant. And, um, and she remembered watching Trump for the first time on the political stage during the debates. And this is what she, she thought at the time. She said, I thought he's got some real uh, uh, braggadocio and he's got some self-confidence we haven't seen in ages. And then get this, she even compared him to Muhammad Ali, right? She said, he is, it, like Ali, she said, he was a braggadocio and he performed and people loved him for that. And we, hear, we heard lots of Trump supporters say these kinds of things again and again, right? They'd say things like, he doesn't back down. He's got balls. He doesn't take crap. He means business. He doesn't apologize. Um, um, so we heard it uh, a lot. In, when, so when we asked Trump voters what they liked about him, they often told us this kind of thing. But, we, but more importantly than that, we also saw honor culture in, in the political norms of these communities, right? So the local politicians were really quite Trumpian. And so consider Joe Policina. Uh, Policina is here in the purple shirt uh, here with Hillary Clinton. And, and um, Policina is the mayor of Johnston, Rhode Island. Uh, and Hillary actually made two stops in Johnston uh, when she campaigned for president in 2016. And, um, and uh, Policina is a, a very popular mayor there. He was recently reelected by a wide margin and uh, we, so we sat down with Policina in his office, and this is how he described his leadership style. He said this, he said, I'm kind of like a street fighter when it comes to politics, because that's the only thing that people understand. You can't be nice, right? You can't be nice when people are taking shots at you. And we said, well, come on, Joe, you know, why can't you be nice? Why can't you take the high road? And he said, no. It shows your weakness, and then people will just roll right over you. Okay. And we saw his street fighting on display, right? We went to a local town, count, town council meeting in Johnston, and those meetings always attract a few citizens who don't like them, and they've got grievances, and they complain to the mayor. And the mayor just let them have it. You know, he openly, he called them malcontents and misfits and douchebags right? Sounds kind of Trumpian, right? Um, and, um, and it's a culture that, um, if you know Rhode Island, you know, it's, um, it existed in Providence for a long time, where machine politics dominated that city for, for decades. Uh, it was first practiced by the Irish and then later the Italians. Um, it was um, exhibited um, uh, for a long time by uh, Buddy Cianci. He's sort of famous, so some of you might know him. He was the former Italian-American mayor of Providence, uh, much beloved in Johnston. Um, and, um, and this was, and he practiced an honor culture to the hilt. Um, he used to have an, a, a poster in his office that reads, it's better to be the stomper than the stompee, right? Uh, hard to argue with that logic, I suppose, right? I guess I'd rather be the stopper than the stompee if I've got to choose. And, and practically any slight, right, could send the mayor charging. Um, there was once a, uh, uh, once he tried to get into a nightclub and was denied access because uh, the building was already uh, really crowded. And so Cianci sent the fire marshal to close the place down. You know, he was so, he was so irritated and angry. And the club owner then went to Cianci and tried to plead his case. And Cianci was having none of it, right? The mayor told, told the club owner that Cianci said, look, you don't want to get into a pissy match with me because you're a cup of water and I'm Niagara, I'm Ni Niagara Falls, right? And that was, that was vintage Cianci. That's how he, that's how he managed conflicts. Okay. Okay. Back in Ottumwa, this is Jerry Parker. Um, he's a close analog both to Mayor Policina and Buddy Cianci. And um, he used to be mayor of the town. He's now county commissioner. And um, recently, Parker got in a tussle with this guy. This is Alex Stroda, who's also active in the Democratic Party in Ottumwa. And uh, they nearly got into a fight in the 2016 primaries. Uh, Stroda was a big supporter uh, of um, Bernie Sanders and 
and a uh, Parker was a big supporter of Clinton. And so they Parker got into Stroda's personal space. And this is how Stroda explained the, the confrontation. Uh, Stroda said, he said, look, um, he said, I think that if we were both frat types, it would have been a chest bump. But since we're both fatties, it was a belly bump. And then Parker said, we should take this outside, right? Um, this guy, this old aging guy, Parker, right, threatened Stroda to a fight, right? Again, these are democratic politicians, um, uh, you know, uh, in, 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 in Ottumwa. Okay. Um, I've got another example, but I think I'm going to move on because I want to get to your questions. Um, you know, um, outside of these places, it's, it's worth noting that, you know, the, the Republican politicians with a crude and combative, more combative style were, were also the first ones to embrace Trump, right? Most notably, uh, Rudy Giuliani and, and Chris Christie. Uh, they have a little bit of this culture and style in them as well. And those Republican politicians who least embrace this style, um, most notably, right, Mitt Romney and, and, and Jeb Bush, were Trump's fiercest critics. You know? So one of the things that's arguably most distinctive about Trump's candidacy is that he violated the social and political norms of a professional educated class. Okay? So one's fidelity to those norms, it seems to me, seem to be a, an important predictor of how one sees Trump and how one sizes him up, him up. And of course, Trump himself has a strong admiration for strong men, right? Most notably, uh, Vladimir Putin, Putin and Kim Jong-un. Um, uh, Trump prizes and, and respects uh, uh, men and leaders who he thinks, he thinks are strong. Right? So one of the reasons I, uh, we think that um, working class Democrats were really drawn to Trump is because, is because he behaves in ways that are familiar and respected in these communities, right? Trump is one of them. He's crazy, he's, 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 he's crass and brazen and tough, right? Um, and social proximity is a good predictor of one's political loyalties in lots of ways, right? It's not often about ideology as much as it is about a sense of kinship, right? Um, okay, the final thing I wanna say is that, you know, many have, understandably said, look, that Trump's behavior is a threat to our collective political norms. Okay. I think that's true. Um, although I think it's what, it, what, what they really mean is that he's a threat to our national political norms, right? Uh, because uh, if you look in lots of other kinds of smaller communities, uh, political norms look quite, quite different. Right? The smash success um, of Hamilton uh, and, you know, uh, r reminds us that how much uh, this has changed, right? I mean, it used to be that our national leaders got in duels to defend their honor, right? Um, and, uh, but this culture of honor has disappeared from our national life. It still exists in a lot of small communities. Um, um, and so in that way, Hamilton sort of misleads us too, right? It gives, it gives us the sense of this honor culture has been extinguished from our political life. Right when in fact it really hasn't. Right. Um, um, the final thing I'll say, I promise this is the final thing. Um, honor culture doesn't uh, import very well into the national orbit. Right. It's it's a um, um, it works better in small towns where everyone knows one another, where there's a lot of intimacy and social knowledge. In those places. Um, it's less likely that you'll, you know, that, that the culture will um, um, uh, sort of breed violence, right? Because people know who to steer clear of, they know how far they can push, uh, because there's a lot of intimate social knowledge. But when that same culture of honor gets imported into national politics, um, I think it's much more likely to lead to, to, to much more violent sorts of confrontations as we saw at a lot of Trump's rallies, right? Um, when there were protesters at some of Trump's rallies, he would encourage uh, his admirers and supporters to fight back, right? So, uh, you know, in one case in Iowa, he went to a bit, there, he, he uh, 
you know, there were some protesters throwing tomatoes at some of his, of his supporters there. And Trump said, don't take that, right? Knock the crap out of them, right? Fight back, right? Be men, stand up for yourselves. Um, and some did, of course, right? Uh, we did get violence at some of those rallies. So it's a culture that doesn't uh, import very well, I think, into settings that are more anonymous, where people don't know each other, uh, where there aren't the same social connections and, and ties. Um, and so the greatest danger, I think, of Trump, in a way, is not, is not really Trump himself. I think the greater danger is that it'll change our national political norms, right? That he, he will help change those norms. Um, the greatest danger of Trump is that we all might start acting like him, right? As, as Nancy Pelosi did recently um, at the State of the Union address when she tore up his speech. Okay, um, I want to I want to shut up because I want to get to questions. So thank you for um, uh, listening to the lecture. Thank you, Professor Shields. A reminder: if anybody has a question, you can put it into the chat, or you can um, also virtually raise your hand, as Art Dodd did, and Art was the first one to raise his hand. So Art, we'll uh, let you uh, have the first question. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I I'm curious. How do you compete to run against an honor culture or how do you decline or say yes to accept a, in a presidential appointment subject to Senate confirmation in an honor culture? So the, the question is, how, how do you run against someone like this, Art? Right. And then if you're, if once he's elected and he appoints people, who's he looking for in his appointments? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, the, the, it's a good question, right? I mean, I, I think the, um, Art, I mean, I think the, um, um, I, I think the, um, the challenge for Democrats in some ways is to, on the one hand, reject this honor of culture because it doesn't import well into nas international politics, but also not seem like um, members of their class right, who are, um, uh, you know, so, somehow they need to, somehow they need to m make a real connection to the white working class without embracing their honor culture, right, uh, because they, they are responsible, I think, for dis de defending a national political culture, which requires civility, um, and then the question is, how do they do that? Um, I think Hillary Clinton didn't do this very well, right? I think this is one of her weaknesses is that she, um, you know, she, she really seemed like a member of, uh, of her class. Um, and, um, and so did a lot of her supporters. I mean, I, I often give this example, Art. I mean, you know, that uh, Hillary Clinton's supporters started a, a Facebook group called Pantsuit Nation. Right, and um, and her supporters saw the pantsuit as uh, as merely a feminist symbol, and it, it is a feminist symbol, but it's also it's also a class symbol, you know. I mean, the pantsuit is is the symbol of the educated professional class, um, whereas Donald Trump right went around with his baseball cap and and felt culturally, culturally like like a member of the working class, even though he was very wealthy and very rich. Um, so the challenge, again, is to somehow, you know, uh, make it, you know, not, 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 not reek of this class, which I think a lot of white working class uh, voters find alienating, but also not somehow embracing this honor culture, which is so corrosive to our national political norms. Um, in terms of appointments, um, well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I think Trump's admiration for the military, you know, I mean, he's, 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 he's uh, if I understand your question, Art, I mean, he's certainly admired um, uh, military guys and generals uh, and preferred, um, uh, preferred um, uh, to appoint and consult people with military backgrounds and service. And I think that's part of his um, appreciation and admiration for, for strength. Go to a quick question in the chat from John McDowell. Are you familiar with the work of Chris Arnade? And if so, how does your work dovetail with his, if at all? 
Uh, so you have to tell me more. John? Okay, yeah, so uh, Chris is a former Wall Street banker turned uh, progressive um, uh, author, and he has done quite a bit of work, uh, like you did, traveling uh, to various localities uh, around the country mm. and interviewing locals. Um, he also photographs them as well, which is an integral part of his work. Uh, oh, he's, he's a journalist? He, he, yeah, he's the guy, yeah. the back row, front row guy. Is that yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I, I, so I can't go, you know, I go on and yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a lot of journalistic stuff uh, we don't, uh, that was done sort of right after the election, John. And, and a lot of it, what strikes me, uh, so there's a lot of people, especially who went to upstate uh, Pennsylvania in the Rust Belt there, and they did a lot of good, interesting uh, work. Um, I mean, it tended to be, um, and I think that a lot of their work does support more or less what they found, right? So they did identify uh, a lot of the journalists who went up there um, were, um, did discover that a lot of Trump supporters would say things like, yeah, we like his strength, you know, we, we like him because he's got balls. And a lot of them said those kinds of things. Um, but a lot of the journalists didn't quite know what to make, make of it theoretically, right? So one of the things we've done is, is to um, talk about it in terms of an honor culture, um, and, 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 and we spent, I think the other thing we've done is we've just spent, um, you know, we spent a lot more time in those places for the most part. So a lot of the journalists are often on deadlines, you know, they parachute in and out. Um, and, um, and so they don't have sort of the time to kind of, um, do the kind of, uh, the kind of immersion that we did. Uh, but having said that, John, you know, we, we, we learned a lot from the journalistic stuff. Um, and it had the virtue of being timely. I mean, I have to say, right? I mean, now that the book's coming out now, um, you know, it's, 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 um, uh, one, one, of our, one of our worries is that, well, no one will care about Trump Democrats in about three months, you know? And so, so one, you know, one uh, problem, and, and this is true of a lot of us who write about politics, is, is that if you want to write a good book, uh, by the time it's out, it's, it's suddenly yesterday's news, you know? And so, uh, but, um, uh, but anyway, yeah, no, I think some of that does, I, I don't think the journalists turned, tuned into a lot of the other things we tuned, tuned into, uh, like the history of machine politics and corruption and nepotism and that kind of, that kind of stuff, but they did a little bit into the honor culture. Uh, All right, we're going to the chat. Terry, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Yes. Thanks for going to Ottumwa, Iowa. It's a place I'm very familiar with. Oh my gosh, that's great. I grew up in a town about uh, 55, 60 miles from there. And um, which one? People, a town in North Missouri, Trenton, Missouri. Yeah. And well, it's on the other side to resume speed. So my question to you is this there is, uh, in speaking with friends I grew up with, um, a high disregard and, and disdain even for national media, which yeah. is based on the coasts. And Washington, D.C. in particular, which is the institution of federal government. Did you sense that in those three communities you stayed with? Um, yeah, I mean, I, sure. Um, um, uh, I did, um, although it's... it's um, um, it, it, you know, but it's not, um, um, there was something, you know, um, there, there've been other populist candidates, Terry, you know, who have, uh, like, uh, Ross Perot, right. Who's shared that disdain and dislike of the D of DC and the establishment. And he did not do especially well in the kinds of places we studied. You know, so there must have been, it, to my mind, there must have been something a little different about Trump. Uh, could have been partly timing, uh, but there must have been some other qualities about Trump that really excited people. Uh, I, I do think that that message resonates, but it's not the first time it's been said. You know, it's not the first time, uh, you know, someone's tried to run on that message. Uh, but Trump got a lot more mileage out of it. 
Uh, I agree. It, and yeah. by the way, I grew up in the honor culture, and it's yeah, it, it's not as your your point about the familiarity that people have with each other yes. mitigating what we would think of as a fight is is common. Yeah, I mean, in fact, in 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 Johnston, there was a fight that nearly broke out in a coffee shop, but someone someone intervened because he knew both parties well. And he sort of vouched for both guys and said, look, you know, you both are good guys. I know you both, you know, settle down. Um, that kind of intervention isn't gonna happen uh, at a mass rally, right? Uh, where there's no social trust, there's no social knowledge. Um, and it's true of a lot of the other political norms, you know, like nepotism, I think, you know, works okay, like, works much better in small towns right, uh, where there's less need for technocrats and people with certain credentials, you know, what you want is people who are really committed and love the town, really devoted to it. Um, and extended family ties are the basis of lots of common enterprises in these towns from businesses to, uh, to, uh, to politics. And so I think it, I think it works better. Um, it just doesn't import as well, right, up into the national orbit. And one of the things Steph and I both felt actually is like, you know, one of the things is we were impressed by is, is what good localist a lot of citizens were, you know? I mean, we felt, we felt, we constantly felt like bad local citizens there, actually, you know? I mean, in some ways we felt like better national ones in some respects. Um, but we, you know, we, we're not as integrated into Claremont politics as a lot of citizens are in, the, in these sorts of communities. So anyway, I love the fact that there's someone from actually from Ottumwa, Terry. Whenever I say, you know, even, even I get students from Iowa, you know, I say we went to Ottumwa and they're like, they sort of scratch their heads and they say, I kind of know where that is. But uh, so that's, that's outstanding. Thank you. A question from Steve, and then we'll go to Midori. Steve asks if um, there were other major factors that you noticed besides the honor culture that accounted for these counties switching from blue to Trump. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, the, another big thing we find is that there's a kind of, um, uh, there's a, people's identities are really connected to the towns that they live in, in a deep way. I think in a way that's hard for people uh, who aren't from small places to really understand, right? So they really fundamentally think of themselves as, you know, Tumwans or Elliott Countyans or Johnstonians. And, um, and this really shapes their political imagination in, in lots of ways, right? Like they really think that, uh, so I'll give you some examples. In Elliott County, um, you know, um, uh, there was a big scandal because a job was, uh, a school job was offered to someone from a neighboring county, right? Uh, that was seen as sort of a moral violation, right? No public goods in this place should go to someone from this county, not some foreigner, right? Not some foreigner from the neighboring county. What the hell are we doing, right? Um, another example, in Johnston, Rhode Island, they opened a new recreation center that they're very proud of. It has, uh, it has the state's only public indoor basketball court, which is kind of a big deal in that part of the country, especially in the wintertime. And, um, and so it can become crowded because it attracts people from across the region. But when it becomes crowded, uh, the local Johnstonians police the courts because they don't want, they want to make sure that no one from Johnston is kicked off. So they ID people. So if you're from neighboring Cranston or from North Providence, you got to wait. You know, you can't get on that court, you know, until the Johnstonians do it. There's a Johnston first attitude. There's an Ottumwa first attitude. Uh, there's an Elliott County first attitude. And so I think there's a kind of local, a certain kind of political and moral imagination that we talk about. Uh, so I think there, there, you know, there's a way in which America first really resonates in that context, right? Their nationalism in some ways does, is sort of locally grown in a funny way, right? It sort of grow, grows right up from the community rather than some downward from some abstract notion like, you know, nationalism or something like that, right? Um, so this is a profound, uh, uh, so they're very committed to their, their, their communities. Their identities are deeply connected to them. Um, and I think this helps unravel a, a sort of paradox in the, in, the, in, the, in the research on the 2016 election, right? 
on the one hand, you have studies that found that uh, Trump did very well in communities that suffered from various kinds of economic and social decline, right? So places where uh, there was a lot of suicides and opioid drug abuse and, uh, jo and job losses and uh, those kinds of things, Trump did very well. On the other hand, uh, if you just look at individuals and you survey them and you ask them about their own financial uh, or personal situation, there's a much weaker connection between either economic hardship or social problems and Trump voting. Right? So the question is, what's going on? Now, a lot of my political scientist colleagues will say, well, we should just ignore the community level studies. Right? Those don't matter because people vote, counties don't. Right? So who cares? Right? What you really want to do is, is pay attention to the individual voters and how they voted. But our retort to that is no, these are places, these are people who are deeply tied to their communities, right? So even if they personally, even if they personally are not out of work, you know, or have a drug problem uh, or, or have economic anxiety, uh, they're still deeply connected to places that are facing really serious problems, right? Um, so I think that one of the things we've added is this, is this, um, is that they have very sort of place-based identities, right? They're rooted not just in race, but fundamentally in a deep sense of place. And the places they are living, the places that they are living are really in trouble. Thank you. Um, Midori, I'm going to bump you for a quick second because there's a, a, ch a question in the chat that I think is a great follow-up from Mark Schwartz. Um, Mark says, after suffering through an economic economy that has not really helped these working class people and bearing the brunt of the current depression, will they support Trump in 2020, even though it may not be in their economic best interest? Yeah, such a good question. Um, I, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to, uh, I, I, I'm tempted to hedge here. I, I don't, I don't know, right, is the honest answer. Um, um, I will say that, um, I, I guess it depends on how much of this is, um, uh, how much Trump is blamed for it, you know? And it's not clear that, um, it's not clear to me that they're, um, um, you know, that, um, uh, that they, uh, that, that they blame Trump for, um, uh, you know, fa failing to resurrect and transform those, those, the, the places that they live. Um, and so my, my best guess is that they'll, um, they'll, they'll vote for him again. Um, and I say that partly for a couple of other reasons. One thing we noticed is they're, they're watching a lot more Fox News post-2016, and they're doing that partly because they're, um, uh, they're, they see the other networks as anti-Trump, you know, which they are more or less. And so, um, so, um, and, and this, that impression is confirmed by pretty good data on cable news, TV news watching. So if you look at the upper Midwest, you know, uh, about four years back, CNN was the major, was the most popular network in that region. And now it's Fox. So there's clearly, um, you know, they're clearly becoming, I think, more conservative and um, more Republican even. And that's, that's sort of the big question too, is sort of more long-term, right? Are these places, are, are they gonna be Republican, really places in a decade from now? Um, and uh, I, I suspect if they're watching Fox News that they, they might, right? That they're, 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 uh, they're, drift, they're drifting in that connection. But in addition, there's all kinds of cultural things that connect them to Trump, you know? So, uh, if, if they see him as one of them and someone they can trust, uh, then I think they're unlikely, they're likely to give him the benefit of the doubt. Thank you. Midori. Yeah, so thank you so much. Um, I just amended my original question a little bit, given okay. your responses in the last two questions. But I think from your, your base presentation, what I was really interested in was um, in your field work, especially, did you get a sense yeah. as to why, like, feelings of kinship transcended or superseded ideology for Trump voters yeah. or supporters? Because to me, and maybe to some others, it's yeah. mind-boggling that liking someone's temperament or attitude would right. trump 
no pun intended, certain unpalatable yeah. ideological stances yeah. that seem to go against everything Democrats would traditionally believe in. Um, yeah. And is the economy or caring so much about the economy bringing yeah. your last two answers, the missing piece there that makes that paradox make sense? Um, right. So I think that's what I'd like you to expand yeah, on. Yeah, no, great. So, so, well, one thing that sort of that political scientists know, and it's sort of surprising to a lot of people, is that people are kind of groupish, you know, so they often vote, uh, they, they vote on the basis of their social and group identities, and not their ideology. And so, uh, so these are folks, um, uh, you know, so actually, I mean, go back to Kanye West and African Americans, I mean, you know, African Americans as a, uh, you know, as a group, are much more conservative than their voting behavior would suggest, right? Uh, but uh, but uh, because their group identities are very strong, and being a Democrat is an important part of that group identity, being loyal to the Democratic Party, uh, they vote. You know, uh, very there are very few Republican voters, right, among African Americans, um, and um, so um, so voters. You know, they often vote for candidates that sort of speak their language, right? That sort of feel like they, they, they that there's some social proximity between them and the other candidate. Um, and we saw this too. I mean, a lot of these places like Bernie Sanders, right? And it, it wasn't because of Bernie's politics exactly. Like po Bernie's way more left than a lot of these places. I mean, a lot of ways these places are more conservative politically. Like if you were to press them on their positions, um, are 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 not very progressive places in a lot of ways, except for their support for labor unions and um, uh, minimum wage laws, those kinds of things. On other issues, you know, they're more moderate, even conservative, but they love Bernie Sanders, you know, and uh, and in fact, one in one in ten Bernie voters, so one out of every ten voters who supported Bernie in the primaries voted for Trump in 2016, right? And um, and um, and they did so, I think, because partly because Bernie just, you know, he screams, he yells, he's like, you know, he he felt he he reeked less of a professional class in a lot of ways than than Hillary Clinton did, um, um, and um, and he seemed kind of like a regular guy, right? Like someone that they recognize and and respect. Um, so, um, um, yeah, so I think the short answer is people aren't as, uh, uh, you know, they're not, uh, they're not, they're not often driven by um, grand principle or ideology as much as they are by, by group loyalties and, 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 you know, Trump, Trump ex exploited those. John asks about your analysis and how it bodes for Joe Biden, the guy from Scranton. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think Joe is probably, uh, uh, I think he's a good choice, actually. I mean, I think he's, um, I, I mean, I think he'll, he'll, he'll play well. Um, you know, the question is, will they like him more than Trump? You know, I, I don't, um, maybe some of them at the margins and the margins matter, right? I mean, a lot, uh, the 2016 was very close uh, in a lot of these places. So maybe it'll make a marginal difference. Uh, but I, my, my advice too to, to Democrats and progressives is to think beyond 2016 and to think about, you know, um, uh, to think about the diploma divide that's opened up inside the Democratic Party, uh, which seems to me is a, is a much bigger, more longstanding problem, right? So look, there's a lot of ways Democrats can win the next election. I think it's likely that they will actually, right? Like if I'm betting, I think they probably will. Um, but the, the party has to ask, ask itself a more existential question. And the existential question is this, what kind of party do you wanna be? You know, lots of ways to win, lots of ways to do that. What kind of party do you wanna be? And do you wanna be a broad-based party of the working class, right? This is what the New Deal party was, very much anchored in the white working class. It isn't anymore. 
maybe that's fine, right? Maybe that's where the party wants to go. But if it wants to be a party really anchored in the working class, it's got a much bigger problem than Trump. And it's got to think much more strategically and more long term about bridging that diploma divide. David Heckendorn, uh, if you want to ask your question, I know you have something to ask about honor and shame culture. Yes, um, uh, just briefly, kudos to Evan and to the college for putting together this series. You hit another home run. Professor Shields, um, I work with international grad students from all over the world, and we talk about honor and shame cultures. Yeah. Um, and I wonder uh, what would cause uh, President Trump shame? Is it releasing his tax returns? Is it getting taken to the cleaners by China or Russia? Um, yeah. I, I wonder what should yeah. we be pulling for? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I suspect there's an argument buried in that question, maybe, David, but, but, uh, but <laughs> maybe, maybe um, uh, but I think what, uh, I think it's defeat, you know, uh, I, I mean, you know, being beaten. And I think he's, um, you know, I, I think he's, uh, I think one of the reasons he's, ups I mean, this is just my speculation. So based on no research really, but so keep that in mind, but I, I based on his, um, you know, based, based on his, um, you know, he's, he's been obsessed, right, with mail-in voting, you know, and that seems weird to me because I'm not exactly sure why that's necessarily bad for, for him, for Republicans in general, you know, there's a lot of older voters, they like to mail in ballots. I don't, I don't quite get it. Um, but I think he's, my, my read of it is that he's trying to create some sort of plausible narrative whereby he can say at the end of the election that he actually won this thing and, um, and you know, and, uh, and that he wasn't beaten. You know, he wasn't defeated. Um, and, and I think that's, that's what Trump, that's, that's what Trump fears, I, su I suspect. Um, uh, you know, um, yeah. It, uh, <clears throat> just so you know, I think uh, between Al Hartuni and then Lisa Domitor, I think we've all learned that uh, radar from MASH is from uh, Tumwa, Iowa. So, you yes, know, celebrities in the midst. Um, and, it is it, Richard Nixon lived there briefly. Actually, he was stationed there in uh, World War II. Evan, uh, it's a Tumwa. A Tumwa. I knew I was going to say it wrong, and I didn't have it in front of me. Thank you, Terry. Um, uh, it is three o'clock, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, Professor Shields did agree to do about ten more minutes, so we will stay on and continue go going through the questions. But if you have to sign off, um, we understand and we thank you for your attendance and. Hope you join us next yeah, I week thank everybody uh, for, for our attending. programming. The other thing I would say is I'm about to head off uh, for vacation, but if you send me emails, I'm happy to answer questions um, and uh, you know follow up on any, uh, any questions I didn't get to that way. Thank you. Um, Ada asks about um, Congress and how it seems to not really pass a lot of legislation. It was seen as doing nothing. Did you think that have an effect on turning out Democrats in 2016? And how do you think that will impact 2020? Oh, um, well, uh, I've got a punt on this one. I don't know. I mean, I'm not a, I'm, I, my, my guess is not very, very much. I mean, it's, I think the Congress, um, my next book might be on Congress. So it's, it is, it is sort of something I'm thinking about. Um, but I guess the question is, would it matter for the presidential race? And if that's the question, um, I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I, I can't, you know, it, it, I think the presidential race is its own thing, um, really independent of the, of, of the Congress. And, um, and, you know, dysfunction in Congress doesn't really hurt members of Congress either. I mean, one of the weird things about American politics is, you know, people hate Congress, but they love their Congress person, you know, they keep voting them back each, each, each election, you know, so, uh, so dysfunction in Congress seems to neither hurt um, uh, anyone's re-election chances in the Congress, and, and I suspect certainly not the presidential race. Although it's its own independent problem we should worry about. 
Uh, Tim Spillane from London, uh, late there, calling in. Thanks, Tim, for joining us. Do you think this honor code America first strong arm technique will still be effective now with voters amidst the coronavirus and yeah. the U.S. is handling? That's, that's a good question. So um, I, this is really throwing a monkey wrench in things. And I don't know. Um, it's a great question. It's one that's on my mind. I mean, if you had asked me a couple of months ago about the presidential race, I would have said, gee, I think it's going to be very close. And uh, it's impossible. And because that's true, it's, it's, it's just impossible to predict. Right, it's going to be very close. Um, but now I sort of, I think, and I think not just COVID, but also the racial conflict and discord. I, 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 I you know, it, it, it may be that um, um, it may be that there'll be enough uh, Americans, including in the kinds of places that Steph and I studied, that will just decide they want normality you know, and, and, um, and they don't want someone they see as polarizing. Um, and, um, and Biden seems like a kind of milquetoast sort of ordinary politician, right? Uh, and so the stock of the stock of establishment, ordinary, boring politicians may have gone up, you know, in the last couple of months. And that may help. Uh, that may help Biden at the margins. You know, I I don't I don't I I don't know. Uh, certainly, you know, uh, Trump's poll numbers haven't changed dramatically, but they've gone. You know, they've sort of gone up and down within a fairly narrow band. But they're at the they're at the bottom of that band right now. And I think the question is, will they sink below that? Right? Uh, can can our events cataclysmic and upsetting enough? that it'll be enough to eat into his really hardcore supporters. That I, that will, it hasn't happened yet and we'll have to wait and, and see, but it seems like that maybe it has the potential, you know, his, his, his numbers do seem to be drifting southward these last few weeks. An email question come in from Evan. Um, he asked, how do you think people in these areas would support someone like Trump, who really kind of often appears to not have concern for others and, and has a very unique leadership style. Um, he said that to me before the lecture, so I'm not sure if that's still kind of- Wait, uh, I'm sorry, Evan, I, I, there, didn't, but, I didn't quite hear the first part. Will you just read it? Yeah, wh why do you think these people from these areas would support someone like Trump, who ah. kind of doesn't really have a lot of their values, tends to not always tell the right. truth, um, appears to not have concern for others, kind of doesn't have that small town concern? Right. Yeah, well, I I think partly they they read him differently, you know, and um, they what what they see is um, um, well, I think I think a few things. I mean, one, they see someone who's culturally working class, you know. I I think he he is one in a lot of ways, you know. Despite, I, I mean, I think I think one of the problems we have when we think about classes, we think about it in too much in terms of money, you know. And there's also there's also social class, right? Which is really about culture and norms and style. In a lot of ways, I think Trump is seen as very declasse in more educated circles. You know, he likes these garish houses and cars, and he's such bad taste. And you know, um, um, these are class criticisms, right? Uh, they are saying he does not have. Re re Fine, sophisticated taste, sensibilities, um, sensibilities, right? There's something crass about him. Um, and so I, I think there's, I think partly his style feels, um, feels familiar, you know, and doesn't, and doesn't reek of, um, of the kind of, 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 of the professional class. And a lot of people told us that very, um, you know, very, very ex explicitly. Um, and then other things, you know, I mean, I think the fact that he's included his family um, in his in his administration feels very familiar again. You know, I mean, I think this is a world in which extended family is in business together or they found churches together or they're in politics together, you know, and and that's just that's just normal. Um, so he doesn't 
you know, from one perspective, he seems kind of like an old patriarch, you know, kind of like a traditional uh, family guy in, in some respects. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I, um, um, I think he's, um, uh, I thought I had another example here, but he's, he's, um, you know, I, I think for, for those reasons, having said that, you know, um, oh, this is the other thing to say. This is also a world that's secularizing very fast, you know, and, and you don't want to imagine that this is the, you know, this is the, um, regular church going, uh, white working class of 30 years, 40 years ago. It isn't, you know, um, it's, 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 um, uh, in fact, churches in these communities are often fighting the local honor culture, right? I mean, the churches are sort of the outpost of middle class professional values, right? So I'll, I'll give you an example. I went to a mega church in Atuma, um, uh, uh, Atuma Iowa, and, um, and listen, and there was a, it was a big crowd, right? And a lot of what they do is they help, uh, they try to help people with their marriages and their relationships. There's a lot of gender distrust and conflict in these places. And I listened to a minister who, who told, right, it, 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 the whole sermon was about marriage, you know, and how to have a good marriage. And he was really speaking to the working class men in, in, the, in, in, a, in a Tomwa. And he said, um, and one of the things he said, look, he said, look, it's okay. It's okay to apologize to your wife, right? Like that's okay. It's not a sign of weakness, right? You don't have to, like, like you can work through conflicts. You don't have to scream or throw things or walk out the door, right? And that's how a lot of gender conflicts are, are resolved in, in working class communities. So it's, it's, um, um, so I think that Christianity is very much a kind of counterculture there, I'd say. It's become one. Um, it's always existed in some tension with honor culture and sort of the elements of some elements of working class culture. Um, but it's much more marginal than it, than it used to be. And, and by the way, their families look like Trump's too, right? Like he's had many relationships, right? They have two, you know, they've got kids with different, you know, different uh, different girlfriends and wives. And, and Trump, Trump increasingly resembles uh, in his own life some of the changing social norms in these places as well. Um, I do have one more question in here. I think I've asked all the questions that have been in the chat. Some of the, there's been some statements with question marks that I think are more statements. So I apologize if I haven't asked them. Jill, I think your question was answered already, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. Anyone else feel free to virtually raise their hand. Um, we go to Russ Chung now. He asks, does Trump's honor culture enhance or limit his coattail effect? <laughs> oh, um, um, does it enhance his coattail effect? Um, that's a, um, I, I don't, um, it, it didn't, uh, it's a great question. It really didn't in these places. Like a lot of these folks voted Democratic down ticket, right? And that's interesting too, right? So they're, um, and that's why they're still sort of up for grabs, right? They're not voting Republican uh, up and down the ticket. Uh, there were some signs in 2018 that they might be drifting more Republican. You know, they've been watching more Fox News between 2016 and 18. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in 2020. But at least in 2016, there was very little evidence of that. And in fact, they are mostly voting for Democratic candidates with the exception of Trump. Great, thank you. Anyone else? This is kind of a last call. Uh, Peter asks, what about his research approach versus utilizing big data trends? Interesting. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, um, so this kind of work we did together, it's, it's, especially in political science, it's become a little unfashionable, actually, you know, because people are very taken with um, large data sets, large surveys, and I get that. That, that, that data produces a lot of important social knowledge. Um, but one problem with it is that it's, um, I think, especially in this era of class isolation, 
is that it's really hard to generate, it's really hard to study places we're really culturally and socially isolated from, right? Even if we have good survey tools. We don't even know what are the good questions, right? Or the good survey, or the good theories to test. I would have never thought about honor culture, for example, unless I had spent time in these communities. And none of the major political science surveys ask about honor culture or town-based identities. So to generate good theory, right, good social theory, you actually have to kind of live in different places, get to know uh, communities in a much more textured way. Um, and, um, and so I think this kind of, this kind of eth ethnographic fieldwork is important now, especially, right? Especially when people like me are so disconnected from the places that we're interested in and want to understand, right? We're, we're, we're geographically isolated, we're culturally isolated, we're politically isolated. Uh, and so there's not a good substitute, it seems to me, for getting out and living in these places. Dana, want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. John, I read Joan Williams' book, White Working Class. Did you, was that something that you read during your, I don't know the timing yeah. of that. She actually blurb, blurbed our, is blurbing our book, I'm happy to say too. I love Joan Williams. Okay, so I really found that book very interesting. I mean, she yeah. talked much more, not so much about, um, you know, the, the, the close identification with Trump as a working class person, but more the disdain for the professional class that the working class in America feels, the disenfranchisement, and how, you know, specifically the disdain for professors, lawyers, doctors, um, that group. Yeah. And I was just wondering your thoughts on her, on that. Yes, I think it's an excellent book. I'd actually recommend it to everybody. Um, one of the things she gets about class too is it's not just about money, you know, it's about these other things. And she's very tuned into social class and, wh and why it matters and what it's, um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, um, uh, I think Joan is, um, I, I think that's an ec excellent book. And, and, and I think one of the things about those professional, that professional class too, is they're often sort of talking down to folks in this communities, right? They go to see the doctor and like, gee, you need to lose weight, you know, or you need like, you know, like, oh, like, you know, you shouldn't raise your kids this way, or, you know, you shouldn't, you know, you got to feed them, right? Uh, more healthy diets. You know, they feel preached to a lot. Um, I think, and so there's a kind of um, there, there's a kind of dislike of that class, which seems disapproving of them, and they don't encounter it just in politics, but it just in everyday life, right? Um, you know, teachers, social workers, um, um, you know, physicians, those those kinds of folks, judges, if they get in trouble with the law, uh, that's the that's the class they dislike, and notably, it's not the business class. Right. I think this is right. a big difference. Right. It's really not the business class. Um, uh, the, and, and this is one of the reasons I think they admire Trump is that he seems to them like, um, you know, someone who made it not through acquiring credentials and a kind of expertise, but through his own intelligence and cunning and, you know, resourcefulness. Um, and uh, and so when they think of themselves right as um, uh, you know, as really making it, right? They, they can imagine themselves becoming Donald Trump one day in a funny way, right? That is, they can imagine themselves through, through, through their business enterprises acquiring wealth. Uh, so he's a kind of, he's, he's someone aspirational in a way. They can't imagine becoming a professor, right? That, that's not something within their, their reach, right? That's not something they, they dream of becoming. It's almost like the lottery winner mentality, kind of, like, you know, the rags to riches story that's just, you know, he, he kind of represents that, even though his background really is, has, is not yes. that. No, of course, right, right. No, of course, right. It gets, um, right. But I think that's, that's sort of how they see him somehow, right? As, um, I mean, I once, a uh, final example, I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I, I interviewed a politician um, in Johnston uh, who uh, is a Democrat there and, um, you know, he came across an old prom video of his from the 1970s, and he's wearing a tuxedo. And his parents, uh, and he's, he's, he was, and so in the video, his parents are telling him, like, gee, you look like Donald Trump, you know? 
Um, so there was a sense even back then that he was sort of this, um, you know, he was he was a kind of uh, a, a model of uh, success and wealth and sophistication. The last question from John. Um, do you find similarities or differences between honor culture and mafia culture? <laughs> well, mob <laughs> yeah, there, there are similarities. Um, the, well, I mean, look, um, Italian Americans in Johnston um, uh, um, uh, loved Trump. Uh, the mafia and political machines were very strong in Providence and were in bed with one another. Um, they're patriarchal. I mean, I think it's one connection. I mean, they're built around sort of a strong man at the center of it. Um, cer certainly the political machines are. And, um, uh, and I think Trump's relationship with his voters is, um, when you think both the mafia and, I mean, it, it, it's, it's built sort of around the traditional family in a funny way. I mean, right, right where the, the um, you know, the um, Trump is, um, is has this sort of contractual relationship with his supporters, right? He's going to be a provider, right? He's going to give them stuff, um, and um, and uh, and he's going to be a protector, and he protect and he expects total loyalty in return, right? And respect and honor. And that's the relationship that characterizes the traditional family. It's one that characterizes machine politics. Um, and it's one that, that I think characterizes the mafia, you know, uh, they're all in different ways sort of built around um, the traditional family. Thank you, John. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we'll have a few sessions next week before taking a, a week off for the July 4th holiday from virtual programming. Join us on Tuesday for Professor Jay Conger in the Art of Persuasion. Uh, until then, stay safe, be healthy. Uh, thanks for engaging with CMC. And of course, thank you to Professor John Shields. Thanks, now, unmute, everybody. unmute everybody. You can say hello, goodbye, whatever you want to say. So here is the unmute. Thanks, everyone. Thank thanks you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Be well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Oh. Very good. There you go. Thanks, thank guys. You. Appreciate it. Bye. Have a good day, everyone.